I'm very happy to see this many uh, people here. Uh, please have a seat. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce <coughs> Professor Mark Geisenroth, who uh, holds the very fancy sounding position of the, the chair of uh, uh, Deep Mind AI at UCL. That's probably like the, the second best title I can think of, like the holder of the Iron Throne or the Holy Deity, <laughs> something even fancier. Um, so Professor Dyserroth has a, has an impressive background in, in uh, various things related to, to RL, but also various other things in machine learning. Uh, he's been staying in the UK for some time already, and even though he, he just recently uh, started at, at UCL, he was at Imperial for several years before that, and before that uh, in Cambridge. Um, he has won uh, uh, various awards, but maybe one thing that I want to mention is his new book, which he might also advertise uh, during this talk. Uh, and uh, I think that book is very nice. I actually, I don't actually quite read it uh, yet, but uh, the parts that I have read have been ex extremely nice. So uh, yeah, mathematics and machine learning. Right. But uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Thank you, thank you very much for the uh, warm welcome and also everyone uh, to you for showing up at 5.15 on a whatever day today is, Thursday. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's quite surprising that you actually want to learn or hear something about <laughs> Gaussian processes and, and stuff like this. I mean, I sent the abstract around, it's totally misleading. Um, so yeah, as uh, Arno said, there is the book I didn't actually want to um, advertise this at all um, but now I can do this uh, you should not buy this you can download it because the down the uh, PDF version online is a free and B it has fewer mistakes and it will be updated uh, if you raise github issues you can fix the problem so so please uh, please do this and the reason yeah so it's this book has actually been a huge community effort so we had about 500 github issues where people found mistakes and made suggestions so we worked on the book to try to build this in um, with some constraints um, but yeah so that's the the book so today I would uh, I would like to talk about data efficient reinforcement learning and I want to spend some time on emphasizing why probabilistic models are useful for this. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please ask throughout the talk. We don't have to wait until everything is over. We can have a discussion as we go along. I also don't have to go through the slides to the end. If we have a healthy discussion, um, let's just do this much more interesting. So if we look at, um, robotic system or if you think about like autonomous learning in robotics we face three key challenges so one uh, challenge is to uh, uh, model the other one is predicting and the third one is decision making if you look for example at this robot arm here so this is a tendon driven robot arm there's a table tennis racket attached to the end attractor um, then modeling could mean that we want to model the dynamics of this robot arm so that's one of the things. But if we have this model, what we actually want to do is we want to use this model for something. We want to make predictions about like future or long-term consequences of a control strategy that we may want to apply to this robot. So we can use, as a given a control strategy, we can now use our model kind of like to uh, predict into the future and maybe figure out whether our control strategy leads or make the table tennis racket hit the table tennis ball. So that's like a, a prediction problem. And then the decision-making problem kind of like maybe in this context would be to change the control strategy to hit the table tennis ball better or you know if we miss it with our predictions earlier to make sure that we hit it. So that's kind of a decision-making problem. So, but there are also some challenges that come with this and so ideally, if you look at um, autonomous systems, we kind of like want to take humans out of the loop to make them make sure they are, you know, they are self learners. So we need to learn everything from data, or the robot needs to learn everything from data. Ideally, in 
kind of like the extreme situation. Um, and that requires the robot to automatically extract information from the data. Um, but in this context of robotics, one practical challenge that we have is that we need to learn data efficiently. So what I mean by this is we need to learn from relatively small data sets. And the reason for this is that you know, uh, maybe some of you have seen, for example, the huge success stories of reinforcement learning in computer games or in board games. But so they, you know, if you need to play hundreds of millions of games, try to do a hundred million uh, experiments with a robot. So that doesn't work for at least two reasons. So one reason is that um, you can't be faster than real time. So you can't speed up the robot to run uh, things significantly faster. And the second is that the robot will eventually break. Even if you had enough time to wait uh, multiple lifetimes to run these experiments, the robot will eventually break because you have hardware constraints. And that's the reason why ideally you want to learn from relatively small data sets to get, uh, the, robot, um, uh, get the robot going. There's also a lot of uncertainty involved, for example, that, uh, which comes from uh, sensor noise, which comes from the underlying processes that we may not even be able to describe properly. Uh, and an example is actually this robot here where we really tried hard to write down so the, uh, the, 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 the physics or mechanics of the robot, that this is a tendon-driven robot with springs and that's very difficult to model. But if you throw a Gaussian process at it, it's quite happy about that. So it just like, um, gives me motivation to run a Gaussian process. But then we also have um, uncertainty because we have limited knowledge, right? So if we have a data point here and a data point here, then there's uncertainty about like what's happening in the middle. So that kind of uncertainty we also have. So what I want to use to address these kind of challenges is uh, a framework called reinforcement learning subject to data efficiency. So I'm interested in autonomous learning from very small data sets and the autonomous learning involves a decision-making process. And so throughout this talk, I would like to go through three pillars um, for data efficient reinforcement learning. And the first pillar we're gonna look at is model-based reinforcement learning for data efficient decision-making. The second pillar is going to be um, something based on model predictive control or mod within a reinforcement learning framework to um, speed learning up, even so compared to step one. And the third one, the third pillar I'm gonna talk about is meta-learning uh, using latent variables, which then um, allows us to generalize knowledge from things that we have, or problems we have already solved to problems which are related. So it's kind of a transfer learning, uh, transfer learning idea. And the latent variables will, will play an important role here. So I would like to start with the first pillar of model-based reinforcement learning. So at a very high level in reinforcement learning, we want to learn to solve problems based on trial and error. So there's an, uh, an agent in, the, you know, in this kind of like uh, pictorial description, an agent that kind of like can execute an action in an environment and then kind of like observes kind of the uh, a reward, the quality of the action in the environment. Uh, but it also observes kind of like how the env environment changes or how the agent changes within the environment. So think of this as a, um, yeah, the effect of the action within the environment. So you kind of like try, um, or the agent tries a few things out, gets feedback whether this is good or not, and then the agent can decide whether they want to change their action strategy or not. So that's like at a high level the kind of idea between, uh, behind reinforcement learning trial and error learning. So slightly more formally, here's the setting that we are considering. Uh, assume the agent or the robot is in a state, uh, which I'm going to denote by X. State could be uh, position and velocity, for example. And so the state at time step T plus one is a function of the state at time step T and the control signal or the action at time step T. Um, the control signal itself is a function of the state and some parameters. So depending on the state, the control action will change, uh, control signal will change. 
And this function is called a policy. So in order to find, uh, or to in order to solve this particular reinforcement learning problem, we want to find policy parameters, so these theta star parameters, that minimize an expected long-term cost. So expected long-term cost, I will denote by J of theta. So these are the policy parameters. And J of theta is a sum over a finite horizon of capital T time step of expected cost at each time step, conditioned on the parameterization of the uh, current policy. I make some technical assumptions like uh, initial state of Gaussian distributed. This kind of a cost function uh, I, or is the or corresponds to the reward function that we uh, had in the picture earlier, or negative reward. Um, and that could be, for example, a distance between the current position of the, the robot and some target position. So this kind of objective here is a typical objective in optimal control and reinforcement learning. It's actually exactly the same in optimal control. But in optimal control, we make the assumption that the transition function up here is known. So always write down f equals this. In reinforcement learning, that assumption is not true. So we, we don't make these explicit assumptions about f. And if we want to talk about autonomous learning from data without humans in the loop, we are much more in this kind of like reinforcement learning setting where we don't really know what this f function is. If we knew what f is, then this entire thing is an optimization problem. I don't want to downplay the optimization problem, so because with op without optimization, nothing is working in machine learning. Um, it's a difficult optimization problem. But here we have this additional challenge that we actually do not know what f is. So what are we going to do now with this kind of like setting? So I'm going to introduce conceptually, uh, say conceptually simple algorithm which only consists of four steps that solves this reinforcement learning problem in a data efficient way. And the first thing it does is it learns a probabilistic model for this transition function that we do not know. If we have this model, we can use this model to predict long -term, the long-term state evolution given a particular controller parameterization. Once we have that, we improve the policy so we change these policy parameters. And the fourth step is we apply the controller to the system. So conceptually simple. So model learning, prediction, controller optimization, apply. But I want to go through each of these steps in some detail, not in too much detail, but kind of like to highlight kind of like what are the challenges that are happening here under the hood. So let's start with kind of like probabilistic modeling. I really want to make a point why this model needs to be probabilistic. So the model learning problem is effectively a regression problem. We need to solve a regression problem. Regression problem means we need to find a function that maps x values to observed function values, which I'm going to note by y. And for illustration purposes, let's assume that these observations are noise free. So what that means is if we have these eight observations here, we need to find a function that connects all of these observations. Okay, so let's do that. Here's my function. Yeah, so kind of like nicely goes through all of these data points and now I have a model. And now I can use this model, yeah, coming back to our three challenges, for predicting and for decision making. So now let's make a prediction here. So the model says at x equals seven, my corresponding function value is maybe minus one and uh, minus 1.5. Okay, cool, now I have the prediction and now I can make a decision. So now I, I'm driving there with my autonomous car along the cliff and then based on minus 1.5, I'm steering to the left. That's kind of like what the model tells, or what the implication of the model is. Any particular problems with this? <coughs> okay, who would put some money on this prediction? Who wouldn't? Okay, um, um, that's good. Why not? Just one euro, not much. Well, I mean, the other function would be pretty oh. bad. Okay, um, what about a prediction here? 
more confident putting some money at the, on this with some arrow. Yeah? Okay. So the reason why I think many people are more comfortable making a prediction at this point is that we have observations which are nearby. Whereas here, there's like anything can happen. And when I say anything, there are like two other functions, exactly what Arno said. There are more functions that also solve my regression problem, um, but they will give me completely different predictions. And based on these predictions, I will have different decisions. Whereas here, it's like they kind of agree, more or less. Now imagine you had a neural network, or a deep neural network that would look even crazier. Yeah? So this is, this is still relatively nice. But the problem is there's not much evidence that any of these functions is about right. Um, and we could generate more samples that solve our regression problem. So the thing is, in the reinforcement learning problem, we need to use these kind of models for long-term predictions. That means even if we have a small error over here, over time, these errors will accumulate. And these model errors will then also lead to something. Uh, so you will not be able to learn using deterministic models if you, um, if you follow this kind of approach. So model-based reinforcement learning has been, I think, stuck in the stone ages and people actually gave up on model-based reinforcement learning because it doesn't work. So the only way, um, well maybe not the only way, but one way you can make this work is to kind of like express what we know and what we don't know. And that we can do using a probability distribution. And in this case, we would place a probability distribution over functions. Uh, and that probability distribution kind of like expresses what we don't know or what we know by the size of the of these shaded arrow bars. So if we now made the same prediction at x equals seven with this model, the model would say on average zero, but actually I have no idea what's going on. Okay, so that's maybe not that much more comforting, um, but if we take this kind of like uncertainty into account when we make decisions, we are much more robust to kind of like model mismatches. And this is what the thing, what makes this entire thing actually work. If you have that uncertainty, this may actually work. Whereas without uncertainty, you have to try really, really hard and plug in a lot of um, specific prior knowledge in order to get this working. So let's use this probabilistic model. And more specifically, we will use a Gaussian process to implement this probability distribution over functions. But really the uncertainty so expressing the uncertainty uh, about the underlying function is important to mitigate the effect of these modeling errors which are accumulating over time. So now we have a Gaussian process for this transition function f. Now we want to use the Gaussian process to predict long-term into the future. So here's kind of like the idea. So initially we start off with some Gaussian stage distribution at the uh, initial time step. And then iteratively, we want to predict the evolution of the state by kind of like pushing the distribution through this one step model that we just learned with the Gaussian process. And I want to take one time step out and just want to kind of like highlight what problems we actually have to solve in order to do this. So here's what we want to do. Assume we have a Gaussian distribution at one time step. Um, on uh, the state and control pair. And then we have a Gaussian process that takes us from the state and control pair to the next state. So I'm trying to kind of like color code things here. So gray uh, represents this Gaussian process and blue represents this kind of like input distribution. So if we want to make a prediction of the next state, we will need to solve this triple integral where we integrate out kind of like everything that is uncertain. And in this case, the state and the control, which are in the blue distribution, but also the underlying function because we have a distribution over functions, which is the, the Gaussian process. So that's the, the gray thing here. And if we do this, we will get this uh, red distribution over here. So there's a slight um, problem, which is the we can't solve this problem because of the nonlinearity that is happening here with the Gaussian process. But what we can do 
others who can compute the mean and the variance of this red distribution in closed form without knowing what the red distribution is, but we can compute the mean and the variance in closed form and then approximate the red distribution with a Gaussian that has the right mean and the right variance. So now we have a Gaussian blue distribution here, and then we can feed this back into the Gaussian process at the next time step and kind of like iterate this process many times and we get a long-term prediction of the evolution of the state where every at every time step the, the state is approximated by a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, so this is when you compute the, the mean and the variance in closed form, that's called moment matching. So we're going to use this idea. Okay, so now we have these long-term predictions. Now let's improve the policy. So that basically means two steps. Based on these predictions, we want to compute the cost, and then we find parameters theta that minimize this cost. So if you now look at the, at the cost function again up here, the expected long-term cost, then, and we have Gaussian or approximate Gaussian distributions of the state at every time step, what we need to do is we need to compute the expected cost at every time step, and then we sum this up. An expected cost we can write down in this way, so it's C of x as a cost function, the kind of like distance function between the x as a current state and the target state times the Gaussian distribution, and we integrate out um, x. And the good thing is the Gaussian distributions are nice if we integrate against them, and we can choose the cost function in a way that we can solve this integral. And we can choose cost functions, for example, quadratic cost functions, but also uh, cost functions that have some uh, trigonometric functions or Gaussian shaped functions. So all of them allow us to compute this integral in closed form. Now, up to this point, um, we can actually make all these computations can be done analytically. So I said earlier we can compute the mean and the variance of these kind of like Gaussian state distributions, or let's see, this kind of like <coughs> of the of the red distribution, um, this one here, we can compute this in closed form. So that's cool. That means we get this evolution of the state in closed form. We can compute the expected cost in closed form. And that also means we have an estimate of what J of theta is in closed form. That means we can write down an equation, maybe slightly lengthy, um, but we can actually write down an equation to compute an approximation to J of theta in closed form. And that also allows us to compute gradients with respect to um, the policy parameters in closed form. And that means we can use a gradient descent uh, algorithm for optimizing the policy parameters. And now we're again back to the optimization problem that I mentioned earlier. Right? So the optimizer, optimization, solving optimization problem uh, effectively in this case solves the reinforcement learning problem. Okay. Um, so the last step I want to talk about is now, now that we've done all the work, what does it actually look like when we apply this controller, the learned controller, to the robotic system? And for this, I thought I'd show you a small video. Um, so this is a, a benchmark problem that people use relatively frequently in reinforcement learning, which is called the cart pole problem, cart pole system. You have a cart running on a track. There is a pendulum attached to the uh, cart, which is initially hanging down, and you can push the cart to the left and to the right, uh, and the pendulum is freely swinging, so the idea is to get the pendulum in into this inverted position and balance it in the middle of the track. Um, so we do not make any specific assumptions about the nonlinear dynamics. Uh, the only assumptions uh, assumption that we make is some smoothness assumption. That's it. Um, because we want to learn from scratch, we really want to make this as autonomous as possible. And so we choose a cost function which looks like this. So this is a cost function, looks like it's one minus a Gaussian shaped uh, function. So it looks like this, it's kind of like plateaus over here. When it then comes to the target, close to the target state, it goes to zero. And then if you go away, then it plateaus again at, uh, at one. Uh, and so this kind of like distance in here penalizes the Euclidean distance between the tip of the pendulum and the, the red cross. 
so no velocity penalties or no control penalties. Um, so what this looks like in, uh, in the video, that's this. So initially we apply random actions or random control signals to the car, it's kind of like driving around. And now we learn this Gaussian process model using these 50 data points that we collected. So we get a, a resample of 10 hertz that gives us 10 data points per second. Each of these trials is two and a half seconds long. So we have 50 data points and this is kind of like a corresponding controller that we get out of the, um, uh, from, from this uh, approach. So what happened here is that it kept the card in the middle of the track, so it didn't really do anything particularly useful. But, uh, so the reason why this happened is it thought it was relatively good, but if you actually look at the predictive variances of these state evolution, they explode after two time steps. So it knew it didn't actually know what was going on. But what was happening, uh, what's happening now is it has data in this regime, in this region of the state space where it didn't have data before. And now it's pretty confident that it was pretty rubbish what it did before. And now the model is updated, relearns the controller, and the next time it tries, it kind of like tries something different. So it kind of like gets the idea of the, uh, of the swinger. It's maybe a little bit overexcited. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of like got the pendulum up and now it has data again in regions of the state space where it didn't have data before. And now it automatically learns down. So it figures out the swing up is a good idea, and, but it automatically learns to slow down the swing up movement in order to balance the pendulum in this upright position. And here you can really see that the, um, every, uh, every trial is a significant improvement over the previous trial. And if you have seen many reinforcement learning uh, papers, they usually say times one million somewhere in the bottom corner, but here's really times one, right? And you don't have to wait for a million or a thousand tries to, um, to solve this problem. And now we can run this for a little bit longer and you can even annoy it a little bit. It can react to this because it's a state feedback controller that we learn. So we get this, we, we can solve this, this benchmark problem in relatively, short amount of time in terms of uh, interactions. Also compute time is cheap in this case. Um, so now, given that this is a benchmark problem, many other people have tried this uh, as well. Uh, the graph is slightly outdated. Um, so this is only like references up to um, 2009. Uh, there's something that, some things that actually are a bit faster now. But effectively what you see here are references um, this is a day of experience or data. Uh, this is an hour of data and this is uh, a minute of data. And compared to, uh, to uh, these com other algorithms, we are um, down here like an order of magnitude faster in terms of data efficiency compared to the state of the art at that time. So what we did was so the big difference, let's say, between here and here is that, um, I mean, also this is coming from Finland, right? So this is this was really cool at that time. So they use neural networks um, in a slightly more complicated setting. Uh, we use a Gaussian process. So that's the difference between a deterministic and uh, uh, and a probabilistic model. And the ones over here are not model-based. They are model-free algorithms like Q-learning, for example. So if you, if you want to run Q-learning, you have to collect a lot of data. Um, but so this is now interesting because we can solve this problem using relatively little data, and we haven't really made any super strong assumptions. So the, what I said earlier is like smoothness assumption, sure, but that's pretty much it. And that also means that this method is relatively general, and we apply the same kind of ideas to lots of different problems. Yes, please. Uh, what is your assumption about the size of the data set? Like, uh, how do you think uh, here that two hertz is like? Uh, um, so it's the the position and velocity of the card, and the angle and the angular velocity okay. of the pendulum. And so on that that scale, if you model a whole bunch of transfer, say the angle of a transfer, it's 
Um, so this, I think the highest we have tried was something like uh, 27 dimensional. Um, the state space was 18 dimensional and the control signal was nine dimensional. So that was kind of the biggest thing that we have uh, tried. Um, if you want to do this with images, then things are a bit more complicated. Um, and so I don't know how to solve that problem at the moment, but um, that's something we are we are actively working on. So, but I don't want to make any like predictions of like when that will materialize. Any any other questions? Okay. So, anyways, so there are uh, lots of other problems or that we that we applied this kind of idea to. Uh, for example, here this was a um, block stacking task with a uh, $300 robot arm. It's a, this is really a piece of junk. It's 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 horrible. Uh, and we used a Kinect camera to track the blocks. Um, here we used a uh, this kind of like tenant-driven robot arm that I mentioned on my first slide earlier to learn to hit table tennis balls. This one is a kind of like very expensive robot arm that plays curling. Yeah, so it, it learns to hit this puck, which then will hit this puck, which will then go into a target area. So that's also something done. And this is kind of like work by other people where, uh, so this is done by Bosch, where they use this, the same kind of algorithms for hierarchical navigation of this kind of like mobile platform through a maze. This is work by Andrew McCutcheon in Cambridge, where he used this idea for balancing a unicycle in at least in, in, in one direction where you can see the unicycle has actually three wheels um, it can only tip in one uh, direction and the reason for this uh, so in simulation we can get this working uh, and in real life it's a health and safety issue because this is a 30 kilogram unicycle and if that decides to drive off you know this is the UK if this hits the wall the wall is has a hole <laughs> so um, it's not solidly built. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is the, um, this again worked by Bosch where they use, uh, use this algorithm to control throttle valves and combustion engines. And that also worked pretty much straight out of the box. I only shipped the code. So that was uh, very exciting. So to summarize this first part, um, I really wanted to make that data efficient learning in robotics is, uh, is important. And I presented a probabilistic model-based reinforcement learning approach, which reduces model bias, gives us an unprecedented learning speed, and is widely applicable to a range of different robotic problems. So um, I would then continue to the second part of the talk. If don't worry, the uh, other ones are a bit shorter than this one. Um, so the second pillar I would like to talk about is um, model predictive control and how we can use that to speed learning up even further. Um, and the motivation, or one of the motivations behind this was that we wanted to look at the problem of safe exploration. Yeah, so in real world, um, in the real world, we often have safety constraints, um, either on states or controls. So states could be, you know, we don't want to crash the drone into the ground or hit the, the table with the robot arm. So I, uh, that does happen sometimes, but we really would like to avoid this. Uh, or you have some constraints on controls where you do not want to exceed like a, a maximum um, torque or um, force on the controls. So for the state, this kind of like looks like a, a problem that is solvable, especially when we have probabilistic models, right? So when we start off and make our predictions into the future, kind of like the state evolution, and we get these distributions, we can check whether we violate uh, state space constraints, and if we do so, we can change our control strategy. That would reduce the, the, the crash probability. Um, so there's work on safe exploration within reinforcement learning, but I wanna talk about how to do this within a model predictive control setting. And further, I would also like to put constraints on controls and not only the con uh, not only the state. That's a bit more complicated. Um, so here, the in model predictive control, 
uh, maybe think of this as optimizing control signals directly. Earlier we had a policy which was parameterized by these theta parameters and we optimized the theta. And for every state, I can query this policy and it will spit out the control. But we can also just optimize the control signals directly. Just, I mean, eventually we are interested only in controls. The policy is not so important. So, and so the idea when we optimize these control signals directly is kind of like appealing because normally we have to solve a much lower dimensional optimization problem. So imagine we predict over say 10 time steps, that would mean 10 parameters if we have a one dimensional control signal. Um, the policy may easily have hundreds or thousands of parameters. Yeah? <coughs> Throw a neural network in it, has a lot of parameters. Um, we over parameterize the policy and that's because we want to have the flexibility. So that kind of like low dimensional search space is appealing, but the problem that happens here is that we have an open loop system. That means if we optimize it, say for these 10 controller parameters, we apply them whatever happens. So whatever, we, whatever happens to the robot, we will apply these 10 control signals and that's a problem because these control signals are optimized on these kind of like models which are not exactly right. And that means now the model bias or model errors will hit us hard again. But so model predictive control can solve this problem uh, by turning this into a closed loop approach. And effectively what this means um, is the following. Within a reinforcement learning setting immediately. So we already know how to, how to learn these Gaussian process model for these transition functions. And then if we are in a, or if the robot is in a particular state, we optimize these kind of like a control sequence over H time steps. And we apply only the first one. We do one step and then the model transitions, oh sorry, the robot transitions into the next time, uh, um, next state XT plus one. So just a one step transition. With this one step transition, we can update the Gaussian process model by augmenting the training data set because we have one more observation. But when we have that, we replan. So in this state now, we again compute the first or the, the next H control signals, which are optimal, and only apply the first one again. So we augment the data set and then replan from this state that we observed. And that means we only do one step at every time and then replan our control strategy. And that is how we take changes or unexpected changes of the state into account by replanning from every state that we observe. So there are also some theoretical results for this. Um, so if you remember, we did this moment matching uh, to approximate or compute these state distributions. Um, but so the moment matching was deterministic in the sense that I said we can write down the equation for the mean and the variance, right? There is no uncertainty involved in that sense. So we can now redefine or rewrite the dynamics of this, um, of this system by defining a state variable Z to be the mean and the covariance matrix of the state. And then what moment matching does, it, it takes the mean and variance at, some, uh, at time step t and the control signal at time step t and maps it to the mean and variance at time step 2 plus 1. So this now formulates this entire system in a deterministic way. And because of that, um, and the fact that we can prove uh, Lipschitz continuity under some mild assumptions, we can apply Pontryagin's minimum principle which allows us to deal with constraints on control signals in a, in a principled way. And then on top of that, we can add, uh, uh, we can check um, for state constraints by using the predictive uncertainty of our rollouts. Right? So every, we said, when we do these moment matching, we get these kind of like state distributions. And if we can check whether the state distribution intersects too much with some state constraints that we define, um, we can replan. So all of this can be written as a constraint optimization problem that can be solved relatively efficiently. Um, 
So now I want to do this kind of comparison now. So how does uh, say so basically we're going to take the the system that we had earlier, the cardboard system, and see whether this stuff actually works. So I'm going to run three uh, algorithms. So we ha the red one is the baseline from before. So now this is a simulation. So the red one is the baseline that we had earlier. And so each of these trials is three seconds. So in simulation, we get uh, we need five trials to relatively confidently solve this problem. So that corresponds to 15 seconds of interaction. So that's ballpark what we had earlier in the video as well. Um, now, the the yellow one it's it's called zero var. So instead of that using the GP model, we only use the mean of the GP. So we still have a non-parametric property of the GP, but we get rid of these error bars. And previously I said if you use a deterministic model, you will it will not work. So if you run the algorithm I introduced earlier with a deterministic model with just the mean of a GP, you have guaranteed 0% chance of solving the problem. I have run multiple thousands of experiments, no chance. It's, it doesn't work. But it works here, which is weird. So the only difference now is the policy optimization. And so the model predictive control part where you replan after each time step and you update your model makes this approach much more robust to modeling errors compared to previously where we only updated the model after a full episode. So here, this works. And it works even better than the, the baseline in red, which is um, unsatisfactory, let's put it like this. Uh, so it works really well. And that is kind of, it's also nice because it's cheap, right? If you don't have to compute variances, you save compute. If you do include the variances, so that is the, um, the blue one, it also works, so that's a good sign. Um, so if we use model predictive control, so either the yellow one or the blue one, um, we get away with less data, in this case 40% less data compared to the red baseline, which is where I showed the video from earlier. Um, but also model predictive control is much more robust to this model inaccuracy than a parameterized feedback controller. And that's the reason why this yellow thing works. Um, so now this is a relatively simple problem. If we go to a slightly more complicated problem, this is a double pendulum problem where we have two actuators, so one in the shoulder and one in the elbow. And the idea is to kind of like swing this double pendulum up and down to the inverted position. Um, then so we have the, the red baseline, which is the algorithm from previously. But now the yellow one, the zero variance one, the GP mean fails. And the reason for this is that the state space is a bit more complicated than previously with the card fold system. And it, it has a mini success rate uh, by accident here. But if the state space gets too complicated, this method will fail. So that is kind of like now the reasoning to go back to the to the one where we actually use the full Gaussian process for for these predictions, so including the variances, and that works really well. And the same thing um, that we had earlier, it's like a third, it's a forty percent improvement in terms of learning speed compared to the uh, the baseline in 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 red. So the, maybe the bottom line here is um, even though MPC makes things a bit more robust, uh, in the end we can't get away without these uncertainties. But now I also want to go back to uh, kind of like talk a bit about constraints because we haven't really done any constraints yet. Um, this one was just learning speed. So we're going to go back to the cardfold system with the constraint that we have a wall now on one side, so you're allowed, not allowed, not allowed to crash into the wall. And so effectively, what we uh, what we get out of this is, um, so the red baseline doesn't care about the wall in the first place because it can't deal with uh, state space constraints. 
So it eventually will learn it. Um, but that's a good sign to start with. If we use only the predictive mean to check whether we violate the state space constraints, uh, the controller gets quite optimistic sometimes and just crashes into the wall. So that's a, a 20% a twenty percent chance. Um, if we use the variance uh, to check whether we violate the state space constraints, so we look at the two standard deviation or two sigma two sigma bounds and see whether the two sigma bound of the predicted state distribution uh, intersects with the with the constraint, then we violate the constraint and we um, re-optimize. So that is all running in a constraint optimizer. So then we only get like a 3% chance of uh, constraint violation. So it's much more robust to have uh, these kind of like um, kind of uh, state constraint. And here again, so propagating a model uncertainty is not only useful for learning things fast, but it's also important for safety. And we get a similar picture for the double pendulum. So to summarize this part, um, I wanted to motivate probabilistic models for safe exploration in reinforcement learning. Uh, and the uncertainty propagation can be used to reduce violation of sta safety constraints. Um, but on top of this, the model predictive control framework increases the robustness to model errors, and that also gives us an increased data efficiency compared to um, non-NPC based learners. Um, yeah, maybe it's a good time to stop here and then I'm gonna skip the, uh, the, the meta learning part. Um, yeah, sorry for, for running a little bit over, um, but I'll, I'll upload the slides and if you want to, you can have a look at this, uh, the meta learning part because otherwise it would be here until like, or keep you here until quarter past six and then maybe that's getting a bit too, uh, too long then. So, yeah, then I'll probably leave this up and uh, thank you for your, for your attention, for coming to me. Even if it's or, uh, already 6 p.m., uh, I'm sure we can have a couple of questions, uh, but if you need to leave, uh, that's totally understandable. Uh, yeah. It's about the, thanks for the great talk. Uh, about the moment, actually, I, I wasn't quite sure uh, you kind of included the one time step in such a way that the mean and variance are uh, like directly mm -hmm. before. Do you need to, what about the cross sequence time step? Can you like just go forward with the same model into like further into the future? Or do you need to make an assumption that you start from the bell swing that you got in the, in the first step and then you go to the middle? Um, Does that make sense? Let me try to uh, formulate the question Maybe what I understood. So there is uh, the the moment matching issue, and for one time step, we can do exact moment matching. Yeah, exactly my question. What happens to the cross sequence time step? And so the we can't we can't make any statements about the subsequent time step. Only conditioned on the previous moment matching, we can again say the moment matching for the next time step is correct. Right. So what this thing effectively does is it does a linearization or stochastic linearization and for one time step that's great and for multiple time steps you hope it works kind of. Thank you, that, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. <coughs> Next question here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is the choice for moment matching dependent on the choice of the covariance function or anything? Yes. So the, um, the close form moment matching depends on the choice of the covariance function. So you can do this in closed form for the uh, squared exponential um, and for the, I think for, for polynomial kernels as well. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, so the, the reason um, now I wish to use a, a whiteboard. I can I can write down the the problem that you need to solve. Um, I guess you can also turn off the thing. Yeah, if you don't need or, to. Or one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's, uh, it's new and improved, so I don't. Mm. Yeah, oh, but it's hard to use. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I don't actually know where the. Uh, 
can use for for the projection to run if you can get six lamps. Yep, so that's a good start. And now Now we sh- should get that off. Oh, it's gone. Um y- yeah, that's that's what I rolled. <laughs> that that used that's to be a switch here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what what about you? Oh yeah. Okay. Looks like you just Alright. So let me let me try to describe this without um so the problem you have to solve is an integral of the covariance function times a Gaussian. So k of x times Gaussian in x and k squared of x times Gaussian of x squared. So these are the things that you need to solve. And you can do this for the, the kernel that I mentioned. Um, possibly uh, some trigonometric kernel. Uh, yeah, trigonometric kernel should also work. Uh, but you couldn't do this from a fan, for example. So yes, it depends on the choice of the covariance function. And do you learn the hyperparameters? Or do you have some books or something that you just learn? No, no, we learn the hyperparameters. I mean, that's, uh, so as in a, in a standard Gaussian process, we maximize the, the marginal likelihood uh, and, and learn these five hyperparameters. No, I mean, otherwise... Uh, And it's you know it's it's cheap. These data, the data sets I was talking about today, they are cheap. You don't even have to do sparse approximations. You can do sparse as well, um, but we're talking about data set size of like two, three hundred data points. They are small. <coughs> ah, okay. So here, there is no longer a policy in the, in the sense that we had before where we had these theta parameters. So what we do now is like imagine uh, your robot can make five steps in, in the future. So step one, two, three, and four, and five. Um, and given the model that you have, you optimize these steps and you can say, forward, right, left, center, uh, whatever. Optimize these five steps, but you only apply the first one. And maybe that, you know, that after this one step, your robot will have made a transition. And that state will be different from what you predicted it would be, even if it's a little bit. And then you re-optimize for five steps. Does that explain it a little bit more now? So one of the nice things that comes also with MPC is that you don't have to fix your final time horizon. So in the um, previously I said, okay, we're just going to run up to capital t, uh, t steps, but uh, MPC, you can just keep running forever. It only optimizes over these five time steps and then it keeps going forever. Yeah, so in this particular case, we use uh, SQT also for the constraint optimization. You said you use any row for all for hyper priority. So it says it can bring in prior knowledge, but then also the complete time horizon includes. Like so hyper priors on, on the covariance parameters. Oh, uh, so you want to place a distribution on length scale parameters. Mm -hmm. So you could do this, um, but then all your closed form computations are gone out of the window. So that's that's it. So we are in that case, we're kind of like happy with these um, point estimates of the hyperparameters. Um, they may be off in the early stages of learning. Um, most likely, they're not complete rubbish. Um, but after you've done like a few rollouts the hyperparameters are actually pretty good. Um, but I mean, you are, I think the, the, the idea is, is actually, it's the right idea to, to place a prior on those hyperparameters, um, especially when you have very small data sets and you, have, you don't have like, you know, the marginal likelihood is not particularly peaked, um, but it will cost you in terms of like um, computation so the uh, computations you can do analytically and in terms of computation speed. So that's, th these are the kind of like the sacrifices that you would make, yeah. Mm -hmm. So about this MPC model, what happens if I get a tiny like five-fold increased optimization for my hyperparameters? Ah, 
okay, so that's a good question also. I'm a little bit cheeky here by just saying I'm going to update the GP model. Um, so what I mean here is, I think I said this earlier, but it's not on the slide. The o so I'm not optimizing the hyperparameters of the GP at this stage, uh, because theoretically this needs to run in real time. But what we can do is we can uh, add the observed data point to the covariance matrix, basically to the training set. I would just uh, do a, a rank one update of the uh, inverse covariance matrix and then so that's relatively cheap. But no hyperparameter optimization happens at this stage. But once we are kind of like done with either an episode or maybe after 50 time steps, you can run that in the background if you want this to do. But um, so this entire thing here needs to run fast, ideally in real time. And that's also a difference um, compared to the previous approach where you can spend a few minutes on, on or if you want days, on optimizing the parameters of the policy. But when you run the policy, it's just a function evaluation. So you can have your deep network for the policy if you want to and train it for a few minutes or a few hours. But when it comes to controlling, also what you've seen like in the video, right? So this is real time control. But what happens there is there's no more learning. The only thing that happens is you take a state, the state of the system, you feed it through your policy or whatever deep network, whatever you want, and it will output a number, which is your control signal. And that evaluation of a deep network is cheap. It's like done. This runs in real time. Here, the learning needs to happen in real time as well. And that's a bit challenging in practice. Uncertainty, but I guess away from the data, you're like reverting to a GP prime. Yep. So that was good for the cartel, but bad for the the others. Do you know why? Like, do you have any? Um. Why? Yeah. So the the reason. So in a, in a cartel system, the state space is too simple. So finding a path from your start state to the goal state is too easy, and that means. If you predict a little bit, you kind of like, maybe by accident, you get the right gradient signal, although your extrapolation is, is not good. Um, but with MPC, um, you know, you can't, almost can go straight to the target state. It's not quite true because you have to, if you look at the, the, the solutions, you first have to drive a little bit away from your initial position to get momentum into the system and then swing the pendulum up. So you have to do this like, go a little bit away and then up. Uh, but for the double pendulum, this is much more complicated. So you have to, and, and so that will take a little bit longer. And then the prediction horizon is not long enough for the, uh, for, for the zero bar, or actually for, for any of those. But if you don't have uncertainty, then you also will not get a serious gradient signal from your loss function. And then you get stuck in this minimum or in this local optimum where you just say, oh, let me just not do anything. That's kind <coughs> of like the solution it finds in the end. So maybe a shorter version is state space is too complicated and it can't see the solution. It can't see the path towards solving the problem. So I haven't talked at all about exploration, right? So an intrinsic motivation goes in the direction of, uh, of exploration. Um, so everything I have done today is green. There is no ex uh, exploration bonus anywhere. Um, so you can add uh, exploration bonus and it will simplify the optimization. You can find maybe you can get out of a local optimum, but I'm not entirely sure how much you need for this. Um, but in general, MPC is the principled way of solving uh, control problems. Uh, so I mean, I think 
powerful theory control uh, community is running on MP3. So it's, it's very principled, actually. So when you mean geometric constraints, uh, something like that you, let's say if you, if you only take a one link robot arm or a pendulum, that it basically can only live on, a, on this kind of like circle. Yeah, so that's actually something we are doing at the moment. So we're looking at, um, so I, uh, I talked about two pillars. I want to talk about three. Uh, but another one that I have not mentioned at all is like incorporating geometric uh, priors or structural priors into the learning problem. And that's exactly something that, um, that we recently started working on. So that I think, so, and you can't imagine how much this gives you because it's kind of like, uh, building in these kind of geometric constraints uh, eliminates a lot of rubbish that you learn. Um, because I mean, so if you know that your tip of a pendulum has to live on a circle, any prediction outside the circle makes no sense. So you eliminate a lot of rubbish. So that's that's what I meant, uh, and that will simplify uh, simplify learning greatly. So uh, when I mean zero variance, I, I train a Gaussian process uh, and throw away the uncertainty. So I only use the mean function of the, of the Gaussian process. Um, and the reason why I train a Gaussian process, you can think of a Gaussian process as a probabilistic way to do linear regression. Um, the Bayesian linear regression model with a lot of parameters. But if you look at the mean, I mean, you can express the, the mean function just as a finite uh, linear combination of basis functions. Um, so we could train this thing much cheaper, but we train it uh, in a way that, uh, or we, we train it as a Gaussian process because it comes with an automatic regularization term. So we don't have to worry about the lambda in, in bridge regression uh, to train the Gaussian process because it's automatically in there. So that's the reason why we train it with a, as, a, as a Gaussian process and throw away the variances uh, just because it's properly regularized properly. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.